Hey guys, and welcome back to my channel where we do talk all things true crime. If you are new here, hi, hello, welcome. My name is Tanya or Titanium Built. You can call me either or, but thank you for joining me for another upload. Normally we do lives every day. So if that's something that you're into, you know, you can subscribe to the channel, hit the like button, all the things that, you know, we ask you to do. So we'll go ahead and we'll get right into it. I'm not going to interrupt it or anything. I'm going to go ahead and let it play through. This is going to be the Idaho Massacre, the podcast. This one here is going to be the change of venue. We've already went over this in one of our previous lives, but I wanted to do these in pre-recorded for you guys so that you can watch them if you don't have time to sit through the whole live. I will put up overlays. That way you have something to look at while you're um, listening to the podcast. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get into it. Like I said, don't forget to hit the like, subscribe, all those buttons at the end or in the beginning because, you know, that'd be nice of you. But <laughs> thank you guys for being here again, and I will see you at the end of this. It was such a heart-wrenching murder that he can't get a fair trial in, in that community. In the interest of justice, I don't think the families want to wait. I don't think justice wants to wait. This is The Idaho Massacre, a production of KT Studios and iHeartRadio. Season 2, Episode 8, Change of Venue. I'm Courtney Armstrong, a producer at KT Studios with Stephanie Lidecker and Gabe Castillo. There have been more than a dozen pretrial hearings in the state of Idaho versus Brian Koberger. The trial had an original start date of October 2023, but nearly a year later, many issues still remain to be decided, including determining if Ladaw County still has a viable jury pool. New court filings reveal the defense thinks that, quote, a fair and impartial jury cannot be found in Latah County. They add that enlarging the jury pool will not do anything to overcome that pervasive prejudicial publicity because Latah County does not have a large enough population center to avoid the bias in the community. Setting a trial date and battling over change of venue are inextricably intertwined. We spoke with many experts to understand the intricacies of the pretrial hearings. Stephanie asked journalist Connor Powell what he thought about the change of venue request on the defense's part. This is where the judge and the defense prosecution are going to essentially battle over change of venue, uh, which he wants to see it moved out of Moscow, Idaho, because their argument is that he can't get a fair trial there. It was such a dramatic and just really a heart-wrenching murder that he can't get a fair trial in that community. And the judge might see it that way. They might not. That's sort of open for discussion. The other issue is where the trial should happen and, and when. And it's a small town, right? Where this murder took place and where the trial is likely to take place is a small community. There's a school right across the street from the courthouse. And one of the arguments for pushing this back and delaying this is to do it during the summer so that the media onslaught that's going to happen with this trial doesn't impact the local community, particularly the students, the kids of that community. And also in the university. So that seemed like a pretty smart plan that was initially going to be this summer. We were thinking July, August of 2024. Now that it's pushing so far, look, I get it. He's going to have to have a trial on the moon to escape people knowing who he is. This is not only national news, it's become world news. And changing of the venue sort of seems like that might just be a delay process and would really slow things down, or if they change the venue so that it's not one that's directly across the street from a high school, it sort of opens up the calendar potentially for them. I spoke with Law & Crime's true crime reporter, Anjanette Levy, who spent a lot of time in Moscow, Idaho, over the past two years. What you have to understand is in Moscow, that is a town of 25,000. It's a college town. And when I was there, the wound that this crime created in that community, the pain, the grief really struck people and stunned them. When I went to businesses trying to talk to people about it, 
they felt like they were personally wounded by this. It just took such a toll that the influx of media, and this is like a place that should be happy and idyllic. And, you know, this was a small community that took this personally. And and you could tell that in speaking to people there, they were doing their best to go about life every day and running their businesses and getting their kids off to school. But this was a horror that unfolded in that town. And so it was a huge deal when an arrest was made. And people may or may not have formed really inflexible, if you would, opinions about that. You know, they may have decided this happened and somebody's got to pay for it. I'm not saying that's exactly what happened, but it's possible. So I could see how moving it might probably just be the best thing to do. And I'm not talking a couple of towns over. I mean, maybe a few counties over. Who knows where they would move it? But I know that Ann Taylor has suggested Ada County, which is Boise. It's a bigger population center. It has a more modern courthouse. Latah County, it's a very small courthouse. So... So for clarity, you mentioned Ann Taylor. And to remind listeners, Ms. Taylor is Brian Koberger's defense attorney. Anjanette, are you able to describe the courthouse and specifically its proximity to the school? I know that's been a major issue. The courthouse is directly across the street from Moscow High School, directly across the street. I mean, you can't get any closer than that. And the courthouse is older. It's a small facility. It's connected to the sheriff's office. You know, the county's a county of 40,000 people. That's not very big. So, you know, you've got the cute little downtown area, the courthouse kind of up the hill from there, and the sheriff's office and the courthouse, it's a building that kind of is in an L shape. And then the high school is right across the street. So it's very quaint. It's very cute. It's a small town. And Taylor has said that summer 2025 may be too soon. Then are we looking at summer 2026 in order to not interfere with high school? And college. And they made it sound like, I mean, the prosecution thinks this is going to be a six-week trial. She thought it would be much longer. I think 15-week was her projection, if I remember correctly. So it's a pretty big disparity. I would have to know more about what the prosecution's thought process is on their case. But six weeks for a case like this total, especially if you if you even get to the mitigation phase. Wow, that's ambitious. Obviously, the, the defense is going to fight, it sounds like. They're going to put up a fight. They're going to be calling experts. I'm sure they'll do their best to cross-examine witnesses and do their best to discredit thing, you know, witnesses through cross-examination. But who knows what they have planned? She's arguing for a change of venue. And You can't tell me that somebody like me, I'm pouring over this stuff every time something is filed because that's my job and I'm interested in it and I I need to be able to convey stuff accurately to the public. But I don't think maybe your average juror is sitting there monitoring the Idaho Judicial Cases of Interest website waiting to look at this. And if they move the trial, you know, she's got a jury expert that's going to come in and say that Laytaw County's biased and they can't have the trial there. Well, if you're going to move it somewhere, then you're going to have a bigger jury pool, potentially a larger pool of people from which to choose. And and the longer this gets drawn out, the more memories will fade. But even the change of venue, and I mean, it's that's obviously defense attorney Taylor is trying really hard to get that changed. But what even is the difference of moving a couple of towns over in terms of people knowing or not knowing about this case that is in the news all the time? Normal people are busy. Cell phones have changed everything, of course, but they're not always on their phones looking at every little development in a case. Data analyst Body Movin is a super sleuth who you may know from Netflix's Don't F With Cats. She has some additional thoughts on the merit of a potential change of venue. I do think that they're going to move it, though. I really do. And I I think it just makes sense, more logistically than anything else, the tiny, itty-bitty little town. You know the media is going to be all over this. People are going to be traveling (laughs) to try to attend this trial. Logistically, I don't know that the city or town of Moscow can handle all the people 
And we've been, Courtney, we follow trials and this is what we do, right? I just don't think in the interest of justice, I don't think the families want to wait. I don't think justice wants to wait. I, I do think it should move. Not necessarily because of the jury pool, just for logistical reasons. It's just, I, I just don't think it's going to be a good thing. What you just said is common sense, but it somehow had not occurred to me. Another year for all those families to wait, right? To find out what happened to their children. And live in limbo. Especially in capital cases, there's so many pre-hearing motions and things that have to be done. And while preparing the defense and, and preparing the, you know, the prosecution, I mean, I think media has taken a, a unique turn, especially with true crime reporting, right? You have people who are independent, I'm using quotes, independent journalists, right? Now who are, you know, their living is on YouTube and social media and they were, you know, they make little press passes for themselves and whatnot and they harass people to get information. And I just can't imagine this trial happening while kids are at school on recess playing soccer in the field that's facing the court and possibly being on a YouTube channel. Do you know what I mean? I would go crazy. And I, I think you're right that parents would go crazy. Of course, we all want justice. I mean, everybody wants justice. But imagine living in that town and you have a 13-year-old child who has to go to school and wade through all the reporters to get there. I'm not saying that would happen, but it could. And I don't think the community of Moscow would like that. Now, I do think that the people of Moscow do want justice served by them, by their community, because this happened in their community. And they want to be the ones to see it through, right? I think they're good, hardworking Americans that believe in the system and want to see things through. I absolutely believe that. I just don't know if they're going to be able to be able to get that done in time for school to be out of session. And, and that includes the university, too, because the town is full. It's full while the kids are in school. I, I think it's going to have to move. Justice moves so slowly. I just don't believe they're going to be ready in, in time. I just don't. I am not a victim's family or, you know, part of the community of Moscow. So it's easy for me to say the judges should just move it and get it over with and move on and get to the issues at hand. Let's stop here for a break. We'll be back in a moment. To get a better understanding of the judicial practices that come into play with potential change of venue, I spoke with Kirk Nurmi, legal analyst and former defense attorney for Casey Anthony. Knowing that Koberger's defense attorney, Ann Taylor, wants a change of venue, I asked if the judge alone makes the final decision. Well, ultimately, there's just kind of a default assessment that the jurisdiction of the court of a particular county, I believe in this case is Latah County, is that is the court that assesses and judge and tries all crimes that are committed in that county. So that is the general presumption, if you will. A defense can look to change venue if they feel as if to another jurisdiction, another county, district, what have you, however the state is set up within the boundaries of that state. And what they have to do in order to motivate that to happen is they have to assert facts to substantiate the idea that their client cannot get a fair trial in the county or district or what have you in the court that they are presently in front of. I'm not asking you for statistics, but I guess how, how rare is it to have the trial changed out of the county in which the crime was committed? Well, I'm glad you didn't ask for statistics because I couldn't give you any, but I will say it's rare, but much more common in a high profile case, because when a case gets so much attention in an area and we're really talking about media saturation, be that traditional media or social media, and how many people have prejudged the case in a particular area. For example, small counties have a smaller population of a jury pool to draw from. Maybe there's a higher percentage of people in that county that already know about the case, that sort of thing. So that 
becomes the defense's job to demonstrate that bias that would violate the Sixth Amendment, and it becomes incumbent on the judge to make the decision. The prosecutor, in some cases, might relent. They might say, yeah, this is not going to be a county where you can get a fair trial. But ultimately, that decision lies with the judge. After speaking with Kirk, I got curious if there were any statistics on change of venue and found a survey put out by the University of San Diego. The survey analyzed murder trials from 2000 to 2020 across all 50 states. There were many mitigating factors, but the success rate of change of venue was just 23.5%. Here, Stephen Greenberg, attorney and former prosecutor, elaborates on the potential outcomes for the change of venue in this case. The norm is they're not going to get a change of venue, and you can always get a jury. By the way, people debate, sometimes they lie because they want to sit on the jury. You know, we had a case involving a very important political figure, all headlines. Did you ever read anything about it? No. Did you see anything on TV? No, of course they did. But, but, but you can always get a jury. And if I were the judge, I would do everything in my power to keep it from happening. Any judge worth his or her salt won't let it happen. Worst case? They'll bring in jurors from another area. They can always do that. Oh, I didn't know that. And, and by the way, it's not unheard of to go to a different uh, venue and bring in a jury pool from a neighboring uh, area. You know, it's always subtle. They just do subtle things. There's little things that happen during a trial that, are, that can be very harmful or helpful. This judge is not going to be helpful to the defense. Not at all. And he's going to keep the case. I understand how unlikely you think it is for it to move. But if a trial moves, does the judge move with it? Is that possible or no? Yes. Any one of a number of things could happen. First, it could, the whole thing could be denied because they have enough to get another pool. The other thing they can do is the judge stays where, where the judge is and they bring in jurors from a different place, which is what I indicated earlier. The other thing is for the judge himself or herself to move to a different venue and pick a jury there. Any one of those three are possible. Inside Editions, Chris Spargo shared his thoughts on security and monetary issues involved with the trial's ultimate location. So you talked about people in the area kind of feeling frustration about how long this trial will be. Do you know any other details about that or can you speak to that? I heard there are concerns, which makes sense. I mean, obviously, that's another, again, that's another cost too. If kids are in school when that trial's going on, that's another level of security you're going to have to get to make sure, you know, there's no sort of overlap. And I think that's not something they really want to expose the kids to, you know, sort of, it's a very, very, very grim, grim trial, even the details. So I don't think, you know, you want kids knowing about that. And I mean, I think there's the general media attention. You know, no one wants their child to be around this sort of media attention that's going on with this trial. Like, I can't imagine being a parent knowing that, you know, 80 news trucks are outside my kid's school while they're, you know, that's just that's just not a way for a kid to live, and that's not something you want for your child. So, I think that's sort of an understandable thing if they want to push it. But again, push it or not, that's probably going to be another huge security cost for them. Have you been to the courthouse? I've not. My uh, colleague has been to the courthouse. I am not much of a traveler. It's nothing grand, and it's it's which is kind of wild when you think about it because of the size of the trial. It also makes it a big problem though because of the amount of power the media company is using and everything. I mean, it's it's really a drain. You know, this this little courthouse being surrounded by all these vans and all these reporters and everything. It's it's kind of chaotic when uh, when it's these uh, hearings. And these hearings are not even major hearings right now, so to speak, you know, compared to when the actual trial starts. And even then, I mean, my colleague said it was wild how you, know, you can barely get in. There's a million people around. It's really chaos. Do you have an opinion on if the trial either should move and or if the judge will decide to move it? I wish the trial were moved for the sake of the residents. I think that they've done enough. I think they've bur- bared the burden of and just just get it out of there for those poor people like i mean i don't care i, I don't think they really care about the jury so much i you know i know that's not really the legal precedent or you know how they decide but it just it would just be nice if it wasn't there for them like i just would feel so nice for them if people just got you know out and did it somewhere else i like i said before though i don't think you could put that jury anywhere in the united states you know and get a, a truly impartial jury who doesn't know anything about brian Kilberger. i'd be nice to move to another county just for like i said just for the people that live in moscow that'd be great but I think it's going to be hard for the defense to prove that any any neighboring county is any more or less impacted by what's been covered in the media and what they know about it than, than Lata. As of the date of this recording, June 27, 2024, a decision on change of venue has not been decided. There was a pretrial hearing today where it was speculated the decision may come down, but that is not the case. Here's Stephanie. 
As the debate over the venue takes place, we found it interesting that Koberger is housed literally below the courthouse in the basement. That's where the county jail is, and he's been there since January 4th, 2023. The jail itself is about 2,000 square feet and houses approximately 17 inmates at any time. So for comparison, according to U.S. Census data, the average newly built house in the U.S. measures approximately 2,300 square feet. So the average newly built house is actually bigger than where Koberger and his fellow inmates are being housed at this time. News Nation did a really good job breaking down a little bit of his life behind bars. We know that there are about three guards working at any one time. And when Koberger goes out for exercise for one hour a day, he's always with guards. There's been a lot made about him receiving special treatment, specifically the fact that he has vegan meals or new suits and a computer and his own television. According to reports, his meals are primarily rice and beans and vegetables. He has a computer or at least access to one, just like any other inmate. He can use a thumb drive to look at documents related to his case, make notes, and then get those back to his attorney. That's pretty status quo. As for him having his own television, that's because he's not in the general population. And it's been noted that the TV is actually outside of his cell so he can watch it between the bars. And according to other inmates who can sometimes hear what he's listening to or watching, he's apparently very interested in the coverage of his own case. Something else interesting about his routine is that he apparently attends mass at the jail library. That's the only time he's actually allowed to be with fellow inmates. And he speaks to a priest in a Daily Mail exclusive, Pastor Mike Hall, who heads up the special group that sends ministers into jails, is quoted as saying, we don't tell folks that we will relieve them of their responsibility of their crimes, end quote but he does speak to somebody one-on-one -on -one occasionally. Outlets have reported that he's been a model prisoner, even though he sometimes gets taunted by other inmates while he's walking by. And one other curious thing, Brian Koberger is apparently getting a lot of attention from women. There are apparently cohorts of women who are reaching out to him because they have romantic interest in him. Let's stop here for another break. We'll be back in a moment. Following is a quick conversation that happened between Stephanie, journalist Connor Powell, and Body Movin. This short chat sent us pretty far down the path on this topic. One of the topics that came up was this idea of people who fall in love or have obsessions with criminals who are in prison or have been, particularly ones who have been accused of murder. And there was a name, the phrase that was thrown out was hybristophilia, which is this idea of the sexual attraction in response to somebody who's committed a, a heinous crime. It just really makes you wonder the why, right? This seems to me like there has to be some sort of unhealed trauma to never want your partner to come home at night is, you know, kind of a tell about something probably larger. I was amazed as I was doing some digging today, Body, that there are multiple social media sites dedicated to the fascination and with people professing their love of Brian Koberger. Is that something you've come across before in criminal data research you've done before? Yes. I, I have extensive knowledge on this disorder. Is that extensive personal knowledge or just extensive knowledge? Personal. Okay. Personal knowledge. So as you all know, I was in that Netflix documentary, Don't If With Cats, and the subject was a murder that happened. You know, Luca Magnata was the murderer, and I was in the documentary talking about it and how he was caught, and I was after him, and you know, all this, right? Well, after the documentary aired, literally the first 150 emails I got were all from the same person telling me what a scumbag I was because they're in love with Luca. and. And to this day, you know, this documentary aired in 2019, the end of 2019. So it's been four years, right? To this day, I still get hate mail from people who are obsessed with Luca Magnata and how dare I. And it's it's absolutely wild. It gives me the creeps. Is that because they don't think that he did it and that they just feel like he's been wrongfully accused and he's this cute man behind bars? It's a mix. It's a mix of people that are trying to be like edgelords 
there's many reasons people have this disorder, right? It's there's low self-esteem issues. People believe they can change him. Others just see it like a little boy that the the killer once was and he wasn't protected and he needs to be nurtured. Uh, There's many different reasons. Not many people think he's innocent. I was going to say part of the arousal, right? Part of the attraction is that he did do it, right? Like that's that's kind of what they get off on. Yeah, it's it's part part of it is this is a really dangerous person. And if I can get them to love me, I'm one of the people he would never hurt or, you know, I'm protected. There's many different reasons that people have this. And I think that, you know, the people that have this disorder think that, oh, well, if I love him, he's not going to be a danger. But there's like a whole subreddit dedicated to the love yeah, there's sort of two groups on social media of people who are defending Koberger saying he didn't do it. Right. And then there's this other little right. subgroup um, that you see, which is like they sort of acknowledge or maybe they don't fully acknowledge, but they are turned on by what he did. And And you're right. It goes into that. He would never do it to me and I can change him. Yeah. I mean, the people who think he's innocent are not in this group of they call themselves bribe bribes. They're not in this group of bribe bribes. They like Photoshop his images into pictures. They have literal altars with his mug shots and, you know, with the turtle suit on. They make like fan cans on Twitter of him, like entering court. And it's like in slow motion with like music playing. And a lot of it too, I think, is the edgelord mentality, right? I'm going to piss off everyone I know because I am a troll. You know, a lot of it is trolling. They want a reaction. They want the attention. They want people to be absolutely outraged by their behavior. It's an internet troll. But they do exist, and it is an actual disorder. There's many papers written on it. I had to go study this because I was getting a lot of, like, threats, you know, literal threats against my own life. But if you look at history, look at how many women were fascinated with Ted Bundy. And even to this day, still are. And the bribe rice compare Brian Koberger to Ted Bundy. It's absolutely wild. More on that next time. For more. Okay, so I just wanted to show you a couple things before I jump off of here. I went ahead and I looked, I wanted to see um, what the Ada County Courthouse looked like because Brian was housed in Latah County where, you know, he was right underneath the um, the courthouse. He, his jail cell was right under the courthouse. There was no driving. There was no transportation other than just him walking up the stairs. So it looks like here at Ada County, they have a bigger facility, a lot bigger facility um, for their inmates. So this is Ada County um, jail. And then also, I just wanted to show you, I did a quick Google Maps. It's a nine minute drive from the courthouse to the jail or the jail to the courthouse. So that's going to be nine minutes every day that he goes to trial, that he's going to have to be able to travel over there. So that's very, that's, I mean, things, things can happen when that happens, you know, things can happen. Let me know what you think about this case in the comments below. It's been going on for almost three years now. We're, we've been covering this. I'm sorry, two years. Um, it happened in 2022. We're 2024. So, I just want to get your guys' thoughts on this case. I know there's a lot of new people coming in and you guys are just starting to follow it. So I want to hear what you guys think. Also, the Bri Bri girls that were um, had the subreddit with the pictures and the video, they have taken that down. That is no longer. There was only one actual person that was doing all of that. So I want to thank you guys for being here today. I really appreciate you guys coming in, taking a minute, watching the videos. It really helps the channel grow. If you did appreciate the content, don't forget to hit the like button, subscribe button, all the buttons, and I'll see you guys on the next live or the next video. Bye, guys.